Welcome to the National Council for Hypnotherapy podcast, where we dive into the fascinating world of hypnosis, lifting the lid on hypnotherapy, sharing insights and tips for change as we chat. So sit back, relax, and enjoy all the wonderful possibilities of hypnotherapy. My name is Tracy Grist, and I will be your host today. I'm here with Ian Lightfoot, hypnotherapist and supervisor to trainee and in practice hypnotherapists. And you're based in Hampshire and Southampton, where you work, is it, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. Southampton mainly, down there in the centre of Southampton, in the wonderful and actually very beautiful historic area of Southampton. It's near the port. But I do, you know, I work with clients in Hampshire as well. And earlier on in my practice, you know, I did work uh, up in London on the street as well. But um, I think I'm focusing mainly in Southampton and have done for a number of years. So, yeah. yeah retired to the south, is it? <laughs> to the sun, as you can see. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's very warm. It's lovely. Oh, lovely. So, so what got you into hypnotherapy? What, why did you decide that you wanted to become a hypnotherapist? Great question. I think it's a long story. I'm going to try and cut it short. I had hypnotherapy to quit smoking in 98. And I think if I'm truthful, I didn't even want to quit. <laughs> so like everybody else's, I had a, a cigarette outside the, the, the chap's house, went in and was very surprised that I never smoked. Actually, I did. I smoked twice since. A, a couple of months later, I, I had a few too many to drink and um, got a cigarette as I did. And uh, oh, is that my delivery? No. And thought, oh, this is foul, this is absolutely disgusting. And then did the same thing in exactly the same place about two months later, and I and never smoked again. So at that point, I thought, oh, this is amazing. This is really amazing. This is something that can really get my head around. Fantastic. And then I forgot all about it for years and years and years and years and years. And then I was in the Navy coaching full time by that point. So used coaching as a business as a business tool, as a, as a leader and a manager in the Navy. And then before I left, of course, I was leaving the Navy to become this executive coach and thought, right, I better do a bit more about visualization because I was getting these techniques with visualization that I didn't quite understand. And so I went away and did a hypnotherapy qualification and kind of had this 180 degree turnaround and went, wow, this is really powerful. It's really important. I can help people with some really debilitating conditions. And um, to be honest, from that moment, I was sold. I, I, I've never gone back, well, I've done a little bit of coaching, but I don't advertise. I'm purely a full-time hypnotherapist and um, yeah, wow, I wouldn't do anything else. That's how I got into it. <laughs> so, so do you work with particular types or are you a generalist? How, how oh, yeah. work? I'm actually a generalist. I really am. And people say to you, no, you should niche. Get a niche and you'll and you'll really focus on that and you'll be an expert in that area and it's like well actually i just help like i like helping everybody you know yeah. so why would i focus when i'm excluding people and you know i suppose what what are the areas that i've had the most success in well every area but um mainly <laughs> i think it's things like drinking smoking gambling porn sex anger i mean all those problem behaviours, I seem to really excelling, uh, excel in. I really think I've probably uncovered a secret or a hidden ability in there. But, you know, I love it just as much when you're working with anxiety and phobias and weight loss and, uh, well, the whole gambit I really enjoy. But problem behaviours are, are an area that I specifically enjoy, I suppose. Any area where there's success, it's fantastic. Excellent. So, so say, for example, I was a drinker or, you know, a mum who opened a bottle of wine early evening when the kids go into bed, you know, that, that sort of general makeup of probably women drinking or, mm. or mums yep. like going, oh, God, thank God the kids have gone to bed, that sort of stuff. How could I, what would we look at if I came to see you? and I wanted to cut down or stop? Well, I think, you know, what you've said just there, you're kind of leading me into it, as, as you well know, that there does seem to be, I mean, drinking is, it's a huge area in itself. I mean, you know, why is that person drinking? 
the sex of a drinker actually has quite a lot to do with it. I mean, and I'm generalising, of course, but there does seem to be that four till eight pm gap, especially as children get older, where mothers are generally really busy at home, and then all of a sudden, it's like, well, I'm 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 not now, and the way that alcohol was used in terms of reducing stress, reducing or increasing patience and blocking out the day a little bit, just greasing the wheels, and that seems to be it then then become a habit. So I think you have a number of things with alcohol. You have a habit, but then you've also got to be very careful in terms of you know have you got uh, addiction, and you know you have to understand what is addiction, what is a habit, and with alcohol especially, you have to be very careful that, that there isn't a dependency there. But say we're talking about a generalized habit, you know, you don't do anything different from all the rest of the conditions. You know, you're looking at that history gathering, you're looking at the habits, you're looking at the, the way that the person thinks. But actually, why does that person want to quit? What is it that's preventing them? Or what is it that alcohol is doing them why are they out of control in that area and only then when you ascertain that can you say yeah we can work with this you know if they turn around and they say you know oh i love that the the, the taste at four o'clock and i know my evening's coming and i sit down and I just everything go you can tell whether they're ready or not so how would i approach it firstly with a billion and one things in mind but firstly does the person want to quit and you know that's where you that's the first question yeah, and you, but you mentioned interestingly, now, and I'm not trying to, <laughs> I, but when you said about stopping smoking, you didn't really want to quit. No, I didn't, but I'm probably highly suggestible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have I've reflected on that many times, and I don't know. It, it, it's an odd, because I'd started to try and quit smoking probably about a year and a half before, and um, I'd, I'd, I'd done an awful lot to just quit in, Stop smoking so that I was so nobody knew I was smoking. I was smoking in secret, patches and gum, etc. And I think that my motivation in the end, actually, if I'm on, on reflection, is that my daughter was a year old and I didn't want her to pick up the habit because I think then I realized how dangerous it was. So, did I want to quit? I don't think I was that worried at the time. Yeah. But I think something inside of me knew inherently that by me quitting, I was protecting by my first child. And I think it was that motivation which really, which which was really, which was the strongest inside of me. So consciously, maybe not, but maybe subconsciously, it was absolutely time. But either way, I'm very grateful. Never smoked again, and I'm very pleased not to have done. Yeah. So I wonder if then, as therapists, we can go into that instinctual stuff that I do surface yeah. <laughs> maybe on the surface it might appear that somebody doesn't actually want to stop because of the second thing but we can tap into that instinct with yeah to... yeah i think in terms of motivation to quit in terms of how they go ahead and quitting obviously very very important you have to hit somebody at a belief level it can't be superficial it has to be right in there as deep as you can get it and as powerfully as you can get it the first time because if you don't hit it as powerfully then doubts begin to creep in to understand so the question really therefore is can we understand if somebody really wants to quit and can we ascertain that at a subconscious level but i think that's where my coaching comes in and as you know i'm i went all the way through up to doctor of coaching and language set is incredibly important and listening to the words that have been spoken because then they give glimpses into that unknown that old jihari's window of what isn't known to the the client and actually what isn't known to you as a coach and it's only by using those question sets even kind of clean language question sets that you can elicit the right answers that give you the clues as to the motivation so could you give me an example clean language question and what would you like to have happen? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is, I would like you to give me more clean language questions, please. And is there anything more about me giving you more <laughs> clean language questions? It's a very closed set of, of questions, and you can Google them, and they're available on the internet, absolutely, and you just download them. But it's very important to only use those questions because the idea is you're taking away your own biases, your own feelings, your own thoughts, and you are simply asking what's there and then adding in the client's words into the gaps. 
and they're either intention development motivation and that's all you're doing so the hypnotherapy has got nothing to do with this is very much a, a more coaching um, technique but the important thing is you're eliciting intention and it works really well when somebody then starts being visual with it. So they'll, you'll turn around and say, and is there anything more about that? And they'll say, well, you know, I, I, I feel as if I'm a flower on the side of a mountain blowing in the wind and it's, there's a storm coming. And what type of storm is that storm? Well, you know, it's when everything rushes and whirls around you and, and you begin to, you know, feed, feed them and begin to put them into this different world and it's a very subconscious world so I, I suppose that's why i like clean language it can be very strange when you're first using it it's it's the very same questions and language set over and over again but um, it's actually very powerful but and also it can be a bit frustrating as the recipient of clean language i i feel like sometimes you're like oh, i don't know what the answer is <laughs> but then that gives you an idea as well when 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 they say that i don't know i don't know i just don't know well, as coaches and therapists, we know that when somebody says, I don't know, there's two options. Either they genuinely don't know, and then you can go down a different question set, or they're afraid. Yeah. Yeah. So e even that answer gives you a clue. You know, what is it you're afraid of? You know, why don't you know? How does it feel? Follow the feeling. W what happens when you, f when you talk about how you feel? Don't think consciously, because then we get into subconscious work, and, and that's our bread and butter. Yeah. No. <laughs> but I like it as a technique. I think it's great. And no, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it opens into a whole different realm of language, definitely. Yeah, it's it's powerful, but it takes practice as well. Yeah. We, earlier on, you mentioned about suggestibility levels, like that yeah. you're highly suggestible. Well, you know, what does that mean for the listeners? What what does suggestible and not suggestible? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we're going into a, a whole different uh, question set. So yeah. when we're talking about suggestion, you know, when you're doing your treatments or when you're at the other end of the treatment, the therapist has a number of different ways of planting seeds in the brain. And, and really that's what the therapist is doing. He's saying that when you do something, you may wish to think, do, feel something else. Now there's a number of ways that can be, that that, that can be that seed can be sown. So we can do it through indirect suggestion, which is metaphor and story, which is incredibly powerful. And then the deeper into suggestion or the deeper into that state or that, that area of hypno hypnosis you're in, then you know the deeper you are, the more direct. So you can be told direct. Direct suggestion is um, incredibly powerful with people who are military, armed forces, police, people who are rules bound. But actually, you know, the whole of the population consists of people who will respond better to different types of suggestion. So as a hypnotherapist, I usually cover both indirect and direct suggestion at different times during the session, and also probably engage in conversational hypnosis before the session because we're selling belief we're selling you can change because actually i know and this is for the clients i suppose i do know that everybody can change because we see it daily and people aren't any different to us so if we can change if that person over there can change if that person there can change from the most horrific circumstances and trauma and difficulties and habits if they can change everybody can all through this different technique of different types of suggestion and they don't have to be suggestion even just understanding there's a better way of doing things and understanding how to do those better things but, but, and it's, it's yeah. like we can readily believe that we can change for the worse i can readily believe that i might eat one donut today but if somebody said can you eat three donuts on Tuesday next week, I'll be like, yeah, I can change and do that. That's not a problem. You know, we, we, we know that we can change and be worse. And it, there's almost like a, a commitment to that, that, that you don't have when you can change and be better. If somebody said to me, Tracy, can you imagine not eating three donuts on a Tuesday next week? No, you know, so there's resistance to whether we can change for the better, isn't there sometimes, well, particularly with habits and addiction and we expect good change to be hard 
is true, but then what are the three donuts doing for you? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We we expect because we can eat one donut, and and why would we then go on and eat three? Well, firstly, your brain's getting an incredibly powerful dump of chemicals in the body is getting completely satisfied with the the chemicals in there the, the the sugar for a star which is incredibly powerful on the body and a huge whole load of reward cortisol adrenaline dopamine blah 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 and and so then that becomes habit forming and then we have this expectation of what we will get when we have those three donuts but you know sometimes we're afraid oh well what if i don't have a donut i'm going to miss out on not having that donut and why should I? But it's only, and then you have the whole kind of subconscious justification because the subconscious mind knows that it wants that pleasurable reward. But I sometimes have an ad- adage, you know, you have to make a hard decision to live easy. I mean, you know, it's a common adage really, but um, you know, you can, you can not have that donut purely because you don't have one every day. So you don't need one on that day because you don't have one the day after or the day before. So why would you have one that day? So you're already doing it. You you have to sell the normality of it and the and, and the other option, the other side of the coin. And reframing is is a, again an incredibly powerful formula for success. What type of donuts, by the way? Oh, diet donuts. Ring diet, donuts. Are the ones with the hole missing? <laughs> the little calorie ones. Yes, of course. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> less fat i do believe <laughs> yeah, yeah unless you take into account surface area and possibly it might be more i've lost you with that i've got a lot of calorie donuts in my head now <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about reframing what, what what do you mean by reframing it's the other side of the coin it's absolutely the other side of the coin. People will talk about things that they are thinking at the time, but they only give you a small amount of information. And we know that we say things about the situation, but that's not necessarily, I'll go back to, um, I suppose, one of my favorite coaching clients, not my favorite coaching clients, but an amazing, so I'd sit down, we'd had a number of, we, we hadn't, we'd arranged a number of sessions. I think six sessions of coaching, it was when I was in the Navy, and we'd gone over to this huge new facility with a Costa on base. It was like new. It was brilliant. It was amazing. <laughs> so I'd sit down and I'd just got, I'd got a coffee. I'd got her a coffee and we'd sit, we'd sat there. And, you know, I, I started with the opening line as everyone does, you know, how can I help? What seems to be the problem? Or what is it that you're, what is it that's worrying you at this moment? And she came out with this line and I kind of looked at her and, and I just reframed it and said, but surely that means, therefore, that you're looking for blah, 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 blah. And she went, that's it. That's exactly what I want. And she got up and she ran out. She even left a coffee. It's the quickest coaching session I'd ever done. And she made decisions based upon that because suddenly her eyes were open. She was focusing on the problem but hadn't realized that the other side of that problem was what she wanted. As soon as she found that, her problem was solved and off she went. It was incredible. That's almost solution focused, isn't it? It is. Uh, yes, it, it is solution focused. It is solution focused in the coaching realm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit naughty because we've been talking about solution focused hypnotherapy before we um, started recording. <laughs> yes, and, and, and some t- isn't all good hypnotherapy. Doesn't all good hypnotherapy involve some form of solution focus, like pulling our attention from the problem into the success? It's part, yeah. Yeah. part of work. No, I don't. I, well, yes and no. Solution focused. Solution in terms of finding the problem. But actually, what I was talking about there was she'd suddenly reached her goal she knew what her goal was she knew how to get there and she realized nothing was stopping her and the current situation wasn't actually a a barrier to her success with solution focused yes you may know where you want to get but the barriers are still very much there now some people that barrier is not going to be there and they will see the solution and they will understand how to get there and everything will be fine but life isn't like that when people have had significant trauma 
and they're unable to get past that trauma by telling them this is the solution this is the goal this is the visualization this is how you get there they still can't get there themselves they can't see that route and that's why with with hypnotherapy we're very uh, hypnotherapy is very good at removing and changing emotional state in order to allow them then to progress that journey so a, a, a solution is bound to work with some people it's fine look this is how you do it oh, wow but if you tell a severe agoraphobic who can't leave the front door that yeah, everything's fine there is no danger outside it's the solution just to get in the taxi but there's not a cat in hell's chance she's going to get out of that door because you'll collapse through fear and adrenaline and everything you need to remove the foundation of where the fear is built upon so yeah you led me into that one <laughs> It was more, I was thinking about, I was weirdly thinking about the donuts. <laughs> it's that thing, isn't it? I've, like, I've done work where adults have, you know, people have been grown up and sometimes it isn't a trauma. It's just a sibling relationship where they've grown up in a household where their siblings got more food than they have or been given the treats where they haven't. And sometimes it can be like a really gentle patterning that needs to be unpicked so that, you know, somebody might go, oh, yeah, no, I need to have three donuts because you know, way back in their mind, they weren't given the donuts when they were a child and their sister or brother were. Yeah. And just all of those things and snipping those dynamics away where they're not needed anymore as an adult. But I, so I, I don't necessarily think it needs to be huge trauma. It can be all sorts, can't it? Like, it, it I, absolutely. Things like one client came in for weight loss and she revealed in the course of the session that every time there was something put in front of her she'd say to herself don't eat that you'll get fat don't eat that you'll get fat and she'd she'd said oh i've said this since i was a child you know my mum used to say to me now i'm saying to it so hold on a minute don't eat that you'll get fat and she said yes i said how many times do you think you've said that anyway worked it out it was millions or whatever and of course you know it's the typical don't think of a white polar bear of course it's the white polar bear so when she found out that she was saying eat that, get fat, eat that, get fat, eat that, get fat. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I've been talking myself into this. Yes. So we'll reframe that language into what you do want, you know, and that was powerful for her. But, you, you know, people don't do these things with bad intention. You know, I think that's what you you kind of mean. You know, we, we as parents, we like to be fair. But actually, is being fair to children the right thing? Because life is not fair. And you go through from birth all the way through to the end of education, trying to seek this fairness, and then you get into the world post-education, and it ain't fair. It just it just isn't. And perhaps accepting that earlier on is a is a is a better thing. You know, we we want to be. You know, fairness is is um is an incredible utopian desire that you know <laughs> I, I would I would want to be fair to all my children, a hundred percent. You know, equal fairness, but you can maybe you have to just give them what they need and, and be all in on each individual's needs and, and desires and requirements yeah oh people people the social fabric of the country damn it we do our best but we still mess up our children yeah but that's why therapy is great it is because nobody has to put up with whatever they suffered from or whatever they're suffering from they, they can they can change and just go out there and just desire to make the change and you'll be surprised at what you get well yeah giving you permission to want to yeah because you're good enough yeah, yeah why yeah. not why not everyone else could like, well, you deserve it you know yeah. you're, you're you're the one unique piece of dna on the in, in the world you know nine billion people everyone is really important and you know better no worse than everybody else of course you deserve it your life is really important live it to the max and enjoy every day i didn't ever think i'd hear myself say that because i didn't really believe it maybe 12 years ago but actually i really do living each day to the full and being content and being calm and not wanting materialistic rubbish and yeah you can really achieve it it's not just utopian it's real you can yeah. have it
And I think it's a bit nihilistic, really, isn't it? But you get to that point where you go, life is unfair and make peace with life being unfair. And then you move through. OK, if I know life is unfair, what can I do? What can I do for me? What can I do in my place in the unfair world? How can I heal or what do I want? And I think unlocking that unfairness door is a good step into that, that acceptance that life isn't fair. But that's the that's the whole point. That's just the one word. Yeah. Acceptance. So what so what if next door's just bought a brand new car? Well, well, whatever. Fine. Does it matter? What if they go on holiday three times a year? And unfairness, really, it, it could be, you know, coveting what other people have. Yeah. doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Nothing's, nothing's really important. No matter what happens to us and our perception, the world doesn't care and it'll keep on turning. Yeah. So just enjoy it. Just roll with the punches and just deal with them and realize that it doesn't matter. You know, what's important? Where's my next coffee coming from? That, you know, that's the adage I took when I left the Navy. Where's my next coffee coming from? If that's the only thing I worry about, then so what? I will always have another coffee. I can't alter a lot of what's going on. So accept the control I do have yeah, and, and let go of anything else because it just frankly doesn't really matter. You'll deal with it and you will get through it and it's fine. And I know people have very bad situations and some people are trapped in situations that seemingly are impossible to get out of but you still have the ability to talk to other people and to make those changes that will make a huge difference to your life i i i know that i'm not saying that everything's peachy and it's all sunshine and that first step is is the hardest i think it is yeah. it, it is and we all need help from every we, we all need help from somebody and yeah. um i think hypnotherapy you know, ethical, good hypnotherapists, you know, they're all around the country and the ability to go into an office in a safe place and talk to somebody who actually does have your best interests at heart. And it's not a financial. Yes, it's a business. I get, I get that. But once you're in that room, ethically listening to you, doing the right thing, helping you, it, you know, you, you can't put a price on that. It, it's just it, it's genuine and it's it's just nice. Yeah. And that's. It's lovely. It's lovely. Mm. And, you know, that's partly why I'm involved. You're involved in the NCH like, because we, I put a little plug there, because we meet our ethical criteria as yeah. NCH members so that you know that you're safe, that you belong to an organisation and you have support. Like, So if you look at your journey where yeah. have your inspirations come uh, have you been inspired by people by readings where's my inspiration come from well i, I think my uh, as i said earlier on my desire to help people is inherent I, I think that's really important if you're in hypnotherapy for the money for, for, firstly you're in the wrong place <laughs> you're absolutely in the wrong place so, so don't even think about it if you're here to genuinely help people, then I, I, I think you, you'll do well as hypnotherapy. When you forget that fact, I think it's time to, to leave. How have I been inspired? I think I'm inspired by every client that rings you and says, hey, guess what I did today? Guess what I've achieved? Or, yeah, it's just gone. I, I I don't know where that's gone or I've done this. Or I've done, I think I'm inspired every day by people. People never cease to amaze me and it's wonderful. That's what keeps you going. Other inspirations. Oh gosh. I, th I think I do like all the forward thinkers and um, people that are, that are happy to try new techniques. I think there's some wonderful hypnotherapy techniques out there. You know, some techniques based in NLP. They, in they, they, they those new techniques, innovation inspires me. I think that things that don't inspire me are things like you need to book 10 sessions and a workbook. Oh, and by the way, you know, you need to pay me up front. They don't inspire me. In fact, I get incredibly cross about things like that because I think they're selling the wrong thing. I think they're selling, I won't improve within 10 sessions. I think there's an expectation there. And I, don't I think you don't know, I, you know, you touched on it a couple of times, like change happens so instantly. Like, how, how do we know that 
change doesn't happen in the second session in the third session in the fourth session like and there's an expectation that a block booking of sessions that change will happen slowly over time rather yeah. than like momentarily because we know where to yeah. tell yeah and okay i'm going to be really unpopular now sorry to all my peers but frankly i don't care i'm going to reveal it yes there was that <laughs> there, there, there was a study done a number of years ago and yes it did come back with the results that um, hypnotherapy was sustainable and the best results were given after six sessions now look i i think it's really for me it's really important for people to understand that they are they people can get the change they want after one session they really can and, uh, things like smoking things like phobias even drinking uh, anxiety conditions they can get this change after one session does it always happen no because we don't know how the person reacts suggestibility yeah. and it may be that after that first session the person sat in the chair and they've closed their eyes and they're feeling a bit nervous and actually hypnosis isn't happening very well and after a second session they get the change it, it's a very very individual journey so i suppose what i'm saying is that yes it can happen after one sessions or it might take longer and sometimes reinforcement really helps the sustainability of the change but for me the best way of working is session by session in consultation with my client saying how are you how are you feeling have you noticed any change what change have you noticed how would you like to take that forward i think it's ethical and i think it's right i'm not going to say don't work with anyone who only does you know block bookings I, I i think that's wrong as well everyone has their own techniques methodologies and and ways of best working but for me ethically session by session i'm really sorry to all those hypnotherapists but um i, I do feel that's the best working for me it's the most ethical i i, I think it does if it's it, it's 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 difficult because you're preaching to the converted and i think i think mm when I get inquiries, people do want a timeline. They want to know how long and, yep. It's, yep. and it is all dependent on how well we work together. You know, yeah. you and I yeah. are present with our training, with our understanding of language, our understanding of hypnotherapy. We don't know what the client's understanding is, the susceptibility, suggestibility, yep. or whether we're actually going to get on well, or whether they've got to get through the fear barrier. So there's so many other facets. Yes, yes, there is. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you can, you know, it's like in life, isn't it? Sometimes you can meet somebody and immediately connect and everything goes, ta -da! and you've got that lovely rapport and lovely energy. And, you know, somewhere your client's been doing the work in the background, wanting to stop doing something or to start doing something and they're ready. And all it takes is ding dong, ding a little bit of word a little bit of language a little bit and you know where to tap because they open for you yeah to. yeah whereas some people have been hurt and hurt and hurt and they've protected and they've protected and then we're working through the layers of protection absolutely yeah it's all we're learning you know all our clients are learning to trust us or learning to feel safe with another in a in a one-to-one -one room which a lot of us don't do ordinarily, do we? And it's kind of quite something for, you know, an individual to go into a therapy room with me and, you know, it might be, say, a young lady. And, you know, I'm absolutely completely different to that person. You know, I'm a, in my 50s and I've had different life experience. And it can be really something for that person to say that things that are highly personal, they haven't talked to other people about, and then be in this vulnerable position of hypnosis. So, yeah, no, you're right. You have to treat everyone, every situation, every client on their own merits. I'd, I'd like to caveat, actually, because um, I know there's going to be people out there going, oh, but what about what? And what about this session? What about? And I know that I should really bring us up. So things like depression things like self-esteem things like confidence you know they're deep rooted as you've just said tracy they need to be unpicked and those type of things i would say are more sessions rather yeah. than fewer you know no no one number of sessions fits everybody and i think that's what i'm getting against you know for a basic phobia don't book 10 sessions if you're thinking of booking 10 sessions for a phobia maybe don't but there again i have worked up to six sessions with severe phobias where they can't even hear the name of a particular phobia because then they they they, they run off so 
Did you say a individual eight-legged creature? Did you say that? That's absolutely the one that, that is usual, actually, that they can't say the name of that <coughs> eight-legged creature because it, it creates this. Yes, yes, that's the one. But it's weird, isn't it? Because I'm quite fascinated with this sort of, oh, I don't know what it's called, nano memory, DNA memory, where they they feel like, or or what's the test where they've done with mice that, that mice have, like, learned over generations to be frightened of certain things, and whether actually we're passing down the fear through mm. genetic learning. Yeah, that's really, it's a really interesting, and, and I think it's quite, new thinking isn't it? It, it it's it's come out quite recently you know the, the point that a, a baby bird has an inherent fear of a hawk in them they just know that they see a shadow and they know what it is and they hide and we think that as humans you know the old thinking that we're completely free and we're a blank slate we're an empty slate or an empty empty slate empty vessel yeah perhaps we're not because we do have you know we are programmed with physical features from our ancestors so why perhaps haven't we got other traits and of course we could go into the past life route but i probably suggest we shouldn't here that's very much down to individual belief but that would probably feed into that as well and um, but yes yeah, certainly i'm really interested to look at the research on that and see what's been said because it uh, i don't think it would change the treatment session as much potentially would in, in terms of where i would go with that but uh, it would be good and more effective and efficient if we had an understanding of where it came from, for sure. Well, and also, yeah. if it is in our DNA or RNA, and it is a, a sort of a, what genetically, I can't remember the term, but if it does come down our timeline from our, you know, ancestors, then it would make sense that a parent would be frightened or a grandparent would be frightened and maybe it isn't necessarily the response of a parent that's triggered it but actually something else in the dna that's kind of looks at the parent and says oh that's why they're scared you know because it's it's, it's a scary thing you know, do things like I suppose snakes and spiders particularly because you can see why there might be an ancestral response to it. I mean, obviously, mm. the science, the, the science, the test was only done on mice, I think, and maybe, maybe there's different ones like with the hawks. But it, it's curious. It's curious. And I and think. How, and, and how are they going to prove it? Uh, I, I think, in terms of natural science, you know, how is that? How would you identify that it's part of a, a, a DNA programming? Oh, um, I, I don't know. I've got no idea. Like Jurassic Park. What you have to do is you have to find an ancestor, a bit of DNA in a bit of amber from an ancestor and recreate it in a lab so that we grow one of the original. No, I'm going off piste. I go, you know, we could have Jurassic Park, couldn't we? That's real, isn't it? Only if we take my DNA and have thousands of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the world's not ready for thousands of me so uh, bad idea that's a lot of coffee a lot it's... of coffee well i'm happy with that i mean i don't <laughs> yeah, yeah but then you open up a whole other you know who the, who's the person you'd reproduce you know you're talking about ultimate soldier there'd be a military um, application i'm sure which um, so don't even we're not even going to suggest yeah. that early and then and then people with all the science money would have to decide whether you invest in people enhancement or robotic enhancement which would be a bit problematic oh, well i know i'd go yeah. i think any anyway i'm not going to um go on that apart from the fact that um I, i'm really not sure that ai really although it will get very very clever i'm not sure it's going to ever take up from therapists in fact i think that um the telegraph had a list of top jobs that were safe and i think that um therapy was one of those jobs that said that um actually you're, you're probably going to be all right but um i did know somebody who was developing a coaching app and using ai as interactions he came to a conference i delivered at a number of years ago so nikki trembay maybe I remember I, I don't know where that's gone at the moment i need to probably check in with that but don't you think like it's that thing isn't it so when we're working we're really aware of our 
biases conscious and we look for the potential for unconscious biases like how we might judge or yeah. and therefore we filter out information in the same way our clients filter in and filter out information coming our biases lean us one way or the other and the difficulty with ai is it it doesn't have any unconscious bias it's just all information, so it can't information sort. Oh, but it does. It does have. It does have bias, and that's been proved. I'm yeah, ab ab absolutely. And this and this was a big problem actually. And there's a series on Netflix, and not series, a program, a documentary on Netflix. Okay, so who? You know, the, the point was who codes information, and I would say that information is coded by middle-aged white men, and, and it is, and so the testing was done and it was biased so it would recognize facially so we're talking i think it was talking about facial recognition and it recognized facially 99.8 percent of white males in terms of white females it went down to something like 75 percent but when you came to people of color it really struggled and the amount of people who were getting stopped and searched because it believed it was somebody else the algorithm was completely wrong so whoever codes that information is the the, the conclusion was that their Bias. inherent biases were going into that information and and so i'm not so sure that automated soft or software that's becoming ai i'm not sure it is free from bias and i think it's a really worrying position that we're thinking that it isn't free from bias because i think that the indications are it does have inherent biases wow you see that's flipped all of my knowledge on its head is watch that... the Netflix. Watch watch Netflix on it. It's really interesting, and it it's a real eye opener because, and it's the same as like a, a a bank. I mean, we're in a stage now where if the computer's saying no, you're not going to have a loan, you're not going to have a mortgage, then that's it. There is nothing. There's no human intervention to loan you that money. There's no risk assessment. It's all done via the computer, yeah. and and so it says no, and that's a bias. Because it biases against different types of people. It biases against your postcode. It biases against your sex. It biases colour, gender. It, it has all that inherent in there. So I'm, I'm not sure that our systems are free from bias. Interesting. It, yeah. it, it's, a, it's worrying times. It's worrying times. I mean, look at China at the moment. And, um, you know, I, I, the, the experiment they're doing, which is so, measuring your social interactions so if you've been to the gym x amount of times per week you can have this food if you've got this you can travel here if you don't the answer is no well you know that's not too far away to say or the government i'll tell you what we'll do we're going to introduce this system where if you go to the gym we're going to give you a number of points and in fact isn't that there at the moment you connect the rings and you get rewards uh, isn't it only a short amount of time before don't okay. connect the rings don't get mcdonald's yeah, yeah you know it, and i think it's um yeah computers are in, in the wrong place um i think are quite a a threat to um humanity actually you think about terminator and it doesn't have to be terminator any ai system can achieve goals without direct conflict confrontation or conflict with with humans because it just has to say no yeah and also we're becoming so much more dependent on screens so much more dependent on you know like a computer monitoring our breathing and our all of this stuff how it's sort of becoming intertwined i was talking to a friend of mine whose partner her favorite phrase when she goes anywhere and yeah. they're walking around is where are the children where are the children because nobody's playing out because yeah. they're all on the screens at home, you know, and they might be networking with their friends, but via this policed system. Mm. Or is the question not where are the children, where are the people? I mean, you know, you go on a bus nowadays, you may as well be sat on your own. The amount of people that you go into, a, you know, you, you sit at a set of traffic lights and you look in your rear view and the person there's on the phone. And you think, oh, great. They might go in the back of me. And then you look at the people coming around the corner. They've just come around the corner and they're on the phone. It's like, what is going on in the world? Why? Why? And then you realize, 
I'm doing it myself. And you think, no, no. I, I hate my phone. I hate my phone. But I also love it. And that, that, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, um, God, I hate it, but I love it. Uh, yeah. It's such a conflict, isn't it? Such a conflict. And I think that's, that's part of it, isn't it? What's it called? The region beta paradox? Where if you, so if you work less than a mile away, you'll walk to work and it will take you 15 minutes. But if you worked, if you worked five miles away, you would drive to work and it would take you five minutes. So I think it's the regional beta paradox. So things have got to get really difficult before we do anything about it. Like if it's good enough. Like you don't tend to change because there's some good. And I think our phones sit smack bang in the middle of beta paradox, regional beta paradox, which is like, I hate them, but I love them. I hate them. Like they haven't got, it hasn't got bad enough. And the scary no. is, is what is going to be bad enough. Ugh. Well, I don't think there is a bad enough. The more time you spend on the phone, the more information you get, the more information, the more you want. You get gratification through games that are um, pinging everywhere. You know, you're getting the emails, texts, everything, social media. You know, you get so much pleasure from your phone, and that's the problem, that you're engaged in this virtual world of that, that really knows how to switch you on in the, in the mind. Actually, yeah. we're missing the reality of life, missing children growing up missing that mindful moment sat in the garden listening to bird song yeah it, it, it's a real it's a real problem and we, and we then have all these excuses don't we oh i need my phone next to my bed because i record my sleep and i play my music on a night to get to sleep oh and then i need to know what's going on in the morning so i listen to the news and then it's my work it's my phone and then it's a society you know what I just I, I was chatting to a neighbor the other day whose dog barks when she goes out by text but no. It, 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 oh my gosh, what? No. So we were, we were talking and her dog starts barking later at night. So I was just checking, is her dog okay? And what, so the dog, she puts Netflix on when she goes out for the dog to watch like Blue's Clues or something like that because the dog loves it. But of course, okay. Netflix goes are you still watching? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so at a certain point, Netflix yeah. obviously asks the dog, are you still watching? And the dog can't use the remote control. And the dog's saying yes with all its bri. I mean, that's what the, the <laughs> state is saying. Yes, yes, yes. So it's been there. And of course, it oh, my word. Yeah. And that's when the dog starts feeling alone. So I said very innocently in my 53 years old of age why don't you put the radio on the wireless <laughs> the wireless <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Went, oh because we don't have one neither do i i know neither do i <laughs> Oh, wow. 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 Yeah. Neither do I. I walked into that one, didn't I? Wow. Right. It's weird, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's just, and of course, and so she listens to music on her phone or, and maybe they haven't got an Alexa or a Google monitoring every movement around the house, but maybe like, strange. I don't know why that's relevant, but I just thought it was quite fascinating. Like, actually, no, I don't have a radio either. Yeah, no, it was it was quite a revelation that you know, and that I rely on online services if I want to listen to a um, particular show. And I would only listen to the motorsport or the cricket or whatever on radio. I don't listen to any programs or anything else. It, everything for me now is podcasts, Audible in terms of books. That's what I listen to when I'm in the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. Weird. Times have changed, yeah. So on that note, <laughs> yeah, yeah, with, with that, yeah, that realization actually is a bit of a bombshell. <laughs> a bit like the end of Top Gear, and on that bombshell. <laughs> it so well, do you know, it's been lovely catching up, lovely talking. Yeah. And um, so, if people want to come and see you, we'll put the links on and. Perfect. 
Hampshire and Southampton. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, Ian. Lovely to see you again. And you. Take care. And um, I hope we don't get too many complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Take care.